Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, today. We are here with another Brazil Canada Talks, 5 plus 5 Essential Tips for a Company to Succeed in Canada, featuring Reza Montalapinur, hope I spelled it right, founder at Ingui Canada, and Peter Hawkins, Managing Director at Malahawk Logistics and Co-Chair of the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce. For those who don't know me yet, I'm Carolina Albernaz, Director of Business Development Operations at the BCCC, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, just a couple housekeeping rules. After the presentation, we have a Q&A session with the panelists. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please make sure to type them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them in the end. So just a quick uh, overview for those who are not familiar with the BCCC. For 47 years, we've been building relationships between Brazil and Canada, straining the bilateral relationship in investments, trade, best practices, and mutual growth and prosperity. Our relationships are private and public, featuring managing directors and decision makers of small, medium, large and very large corporations and institutions in our volunteer board of directors has expertise, knowledge and connections that can only be found by being active players in the Brazil Canada market. Our membership based association and we support our members through information networking. So if you want to learn a, bit, a little bit more about us, please do not hesitate to connect with me. Canada is known by being a country that welcomes immigrants from many different backgrounds. But if there's one category of immigration that gets special attention is the business category. Canada is very focused in attracting foreign direct, direct investment and has many immigration programs to support those foreign companies, executives and entrepreneurs interested in establishing presence in the Canadian market. But immigration is just a small piece of the puzzle. Success depends not only on the pathway you choose, but also how you adapt to the Canadian way of doing business the Canadian life, and most important, how you prepare for this life journey. Our two speakers today are in perfect position to help you understand the do's and don'ts when doing business in Canada. Reza, a successful immigrant himself, understands how difficult and frustrating it can be sometimes to navigate the process. And Peter, our co-chair and a volunteer mentor and champion of newcomers, new grads, women entrepreneurs, and people re-entering the workforce. People was also, Peter was also named Mississauga Business Person of the Year in 2018 and has been recently recognized for his volunteer work by being a 2020 winner for Access Employment Walk of Fame Award. So without further ado, uh, why don't we start with Reza and uh, he's, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of the immigration programs available for companies as well as your five main points on how to succeed in Canada. Thank you, Carolina, for having me today. Um, so I'll share my screen if that's okay. Um, let me see here. So we'll do a quick overview. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so Ingwe Immigration, uh, that's uh, the company that I have started here in Toronto, Canada. We have three offices worldwide. We serve clients in 25 countries and we have 11 staff in Toronto and the rest of our staff in our overseas offices. Our team speaks over seven languages um, and basically we're a boutique immigration investment consulting firm. We are managed and operated by first generation immigrants. So myself and 99.9% .9 of everybody in this company are first generation immigrants. Uh, a little bit about myself, which is important for everybody to know. Well, I immigrated through four different countries. Uh, I moved to Canada twice. So I had to move out and I moved back in once. <laughs> um, I sponsored my wife. I helped my in-laws immigrate here. I initiated a uh, federal court appeal uh, to allow my sister-in-law to immigrate with my parents-in-law. And I'm currently helping my brother-in-law immigrate to Canada. And I own and operate four family businesses in Canada. So that means basically I know where everybody's coming from. Uh, I'm not just sitting on my high chair and you know dictating immigration experiences or regulations. Uh, I've gone through the process myself and my family has as well. And we're still immigrating, as you can see. <laughs> the, I, the I process I yeah. want to interject something, Reza, because you're being a little bit too modest there. One thing we have to really underline that Reza is a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, and that is a regulated profession in Canada. And so he is exactly what he says he is. So when he makes, well, I don't think you actually make promises, but when he says he's going to do something, he is legally allowed to do it. I want to underline that. Yes, thank you, Peter. Sometimes I forget to mention that because it's, <laughs> You know, I, sometimes you assume, which you shouldn't assume, that people know, right? So that's the key point here. 
so I'll jump in quickly a little bit about uh, immigration. Um, generally, I'm not going to uh, get into too much detail, obviously. There's over 75 immigration programs in Canada at the regional, provincial, and federal level. Uh, five of them are at the federal level for business immigration. Eleven of them are at the provincial and territorial level, like territories meaning Yukon, for example. Um, two out of each of these categories offer permanent residency on arrival. So two out of the federal programs and two out of the provincial programs offer permanent residency on arrival. The rest of them are work permits, which have paths to permanent residency, some of them through nomination, some of them are a little bit more complicated. So that's just general overview. Uh, on the federal side, uh, as I said, I'm just gonna touch on the topic very lightly. I don't wanna get into too much detail. We have the federal business immigration program. So one is the startup visa, which everybody knows about. So you have to have either an, innovation, an innovative, scalable, and it should have economic benefit for, uh, for Canada to be able to apply under this program. You need a designated organization to issue a letter of support for you, whether it's venture capital, angel investor, or incubator. So something that most people don't know is that, okay, if your business has been operating for five years or more in your home country, you can still apply as a startup. You don't have to be brand new. And the same goes true for a company which doesn't exist. If you have an idea and you can document in a proper business plan and an incubator, or angel investor, or venture capital has the appetite to take that risk, they can support you, you can come through. So both ends of the spectrum are completely possible. The self-employed stream, that's just for uh, artists, um, professions in culture and uh, athletics. So it's not for the typical entrepreneur, but that's another business immigration stream. Then we fall into the international mobility programs, which are based on the free trade agreement. So when I mentioned T21 to T53, these are exemption codes that they offer for work permits for investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a little bit of a technical lingo. Nobody needs to memorize this. Um, free trade agreement. So if you're from Mexico, Peru, Colombia, uh, Panama, uh, um, Chile, they all have free trade agreements in place which allow professionals, business, uh, business persons and or investors to enter Canada based on a work permit. The intercompany transfer is also very common. It's very interchangeable with the entrepreneur work permit. They're both per work permits. Uh, if you have a company and you want to set up a branch, a joint venture in Canada, uh, you can uh, go through these programs to allow your workers, your management, or the owners of the company to obtain work permits and to work in Canada to set up these branches or to operate these companies. These are not intended for immigration. So international mobility program assists in the mobility of professionals and business persons. It's not intended for full out immigration, but you can link it to an immigration program afterwards. But the intention should not be immigration. So if you're setting up a company under the intercompany transfer, and then Immigration Canada will be like, well, who's going to be handling your business back home? Because, you know, that's the big question. So you have to have your business running back in your home country while you're setting up that branch office or that new joint venture entity or a subsidy. Uh, subsidiary. Uh, so that's just a general overview for the federal side. We'll go to the provincial side. So you have the provincial business immigration programs, which are the entrepreneurial provincial nominee programs. Uh, and that's typically you come and invest. There's a points-based system. You obtain a work permit in 90% of the cases, except one of the provinces, which is New Brunswick which offers a permanent residency instead of a work permit. You work anywhere from a one year to two years and you get nominated uh, afterwards if you have implemented your business plan correctly. And they're always looking for economic benefit for that province or region. There's two substreams for the entrepreneur provincial programs. One is the international graduate entrepreneur program, which is basically you've studied here as an international student, you've uh, graduated, 
from a post-secondary institution in one of three provinces and you start your own business. Uh, afterwards, the province may nominate you for uh, a permanent residency. The corporate entrepreneur stream is for large enterprises which will invest $1 million or more. They have certain criteria in terms of the revenue, how many people they're bringing over, which are more niche and specialized and obviously not for everybody. But that's a substream of the provincial programs. And then of course we have Quebec. Quebec is always special in our hearts here in Canada. And uh, they have their Quebec Immigrant Investor Program, which is the only passive investment immigration program in all of Canada which basically means they look at your money, how have you legally obtained it? And there's really very limited criteria besides that. Um, and they would nominate you for a permanent residency. It's a little bit lengthy process if you're not already a Francophone, so a French speaking applicant. But that basically gives you an idea of the provincial side. Uh, so that was like the fastest three minute immigration workshop you, you <laughs> probably ever see for business immigration. Okay. I didn't want to bore everybody too much. Here's some interesting facts that many people don't know. Okay. Or it's not discussed as commonly. It's all available online, obviously, but not as commonly known. So you can actually appeal in federal court for refusals of visitor visas, work permits, study permits. Uh, so this is a, you know, a lot of people don't go this route because either A, they don't get reviews or two, they don't have the financial resources or the timeline to go through that. So if there's an error of law, you can apply for judicial review. That's been done and our office assists with that as well because we have lawyers that we will cooperate with uh, specifically for that, those kinds of cases. And the second point is you don't even need to be in Canada or have ever applied for Canadian visa status to own assets in Canada. So you could be majority shareholder in a company, you could have properties, you could, there's a lot of things that you can own and have never even stepped foot into Canada. So again, that's another point that many people may misconceive. The tax system, the famous tax system in Canada. Most newcomers, especially from the Asian countries, they hide their assets. They don't declare them, which I advise strongly against because the Canadian government is going to only tax you on your income, not on your assets. So this is a huge, huge misconception across the board, across like most newcomers and new immigrants. So uh, that's another point. And then the last point, which is not a very good point, is that let's say you've been accepted for permanent residency. You're you know, sitting back home, you get your confirmation of PI, your passport is stamped and you're coming into Canada and you're at the border and let's say you were nominated by, I don't know, a province, let's say a specific province or a specific business stream. And you come in and you go through a different city or province. And then the border officer, the Canadian border service agents ask you, well, why are you here? What's your plan? And you forget to tell them that you're planning to do that business or you're planning to go to that province region that's nominated for you for PR and they can refuse you at the border. They are legally allowed to refuse anybody at the border if they don't meet the eligibility criteria that led to their permanent residency or their study permit or their visitor visa or their work permit. So this is until you're here and you physically have your permanent residency in your hand, it's not over. Okay, this is, this is another big point. And now we're gonna jump into the, the five key success points from my point of view. Um, obviously, uh, Peter will share his as well. And there's, I think there's a, a little bit of overlap, definitely. <laughs> Ours are basically based on the immigration business side. So number one, you need local expertise. Okay, to set up to operate your business or whatever you need to do, whether it's networking or research. So whether it's tax lawyers, uh, uh, CPAs for your taxation, uh, HR, you know, there's a lot of HR regulations and there a lot of them are very provincial. And of course, logistics, warehousing customs. So if you're doing products, import, export, it's huge and, and Peter can, probably give more insight into that. It's a big country. It's over 9,000 kilometers wide. 
So please do not underestimate Canada in terms of the size. The population is small, but the country is huge. You need local expertise. Don't assume that you can do everything yourself. Uh, don't outsource your bookkeeping, accounting, or any financial offer. If you have a full-fledged operation from personal experience, I would not outsource uh, unless you're doing uh, very light work and you don't have like a full company with payroll and everything. The third point I would say is that set a proper timeline. It is not fast. Immigrating or setting up a company is not fast. That means we can register a company, but to start your operations, to get your people in place, to have everything in in, in you know proper uh, working order it will take time and then in order to break even and be successfully established here that takes time so i usually recommend three years sometimes up to five but three years is a good number that i think everybody can digest properly and of course if you've been working here with your canadian partners or you've been importing or exporting before uh, you already have an established market, that three-year timeline could be significantly shorter. Uh, the fourth point is select your location in Canada very carefully. This is critical, extremely cl critical, because this is what Peter will probably touch up on as well in terms of the soft skills required in terms of behind the business side of things. From the business point of view, logistics is a very expensive part of business in Canada, okay? A lot of countries, let's say you're inside of Germany, it may not be so expensive moving cargo around. When you're looking at railing cargo from, let's say Vancouver to Montreal or shipping from China to, to, to Toronto, did you know most of the cargo goes to, to Vancouver and is railed? And if you don't have the right, and in the winter they have the, the weight limits. So if you stuff too much into your, into your container and it's winter time, you're, you're dead meat basically. Uh, so, wait, then, so that's actually the spring thaw issue. It's at yeah. the end of the winter when the ground is soft, then you have uh, five to 10,000 kilos less allowed in a container so that uh, yeah, exactly. the containers don't destroy the roads. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is why you would need somebody like Peter to sort of guide you because these, this is a big country, folks. Don't underestimate. And then you've got taxes because we are taxed provincially and federally. If you're in Quebec, you're going to file your taxes twice because you've got Ministry of Revenue in Quebec and you have the Canadian Revenue Agents. Other provinces, you just file it once, but then you have different tax regulations. If you need to import your raw materials or your product, look at your destination market. Where are the major ports? What are the logistics costs to get it to your end user market? If you're in the middle of nowhere and you need to import your cargo and then reship it back to your destination market inside of Canada, the logistics could literally wipe you out, uh -huh. okay? So this is why you need people like Peter on your side. So remember that. <laughs> and the fifth point is research, research, do your homework, okay? Be prepared, don't assume anything don't think you'll just go with the flow make sure you know every single detail about what you want to do have a contingency plan in place as well uh, so this means working with professionals whether it's back home through your network or whether you've hired them here in canada or any country these rules could probably apply for most people that want to immigrate or set up a business in anywhere in the world Okay, this is not just for Canada, probably you could apply this to many countries, right? You have to be localized, you have to do your research, select your location very carefully. Um, for easy mistakes, this is, you know, this is, this is the easy stuff, the easy mistakes, everybody can make these mistakes. Moving our computer or my family can is fast. No, it's not. <laughs> That's the first thing. It's a lengthy process, whether it's the initial move or it's the entire move, the company itself or the family setting them up. You have to have a proper timeline in place and you have to be patient and you have to work with somebody who knows what they're doing so they can give you a proper timeline. Don't depend on the website process in terms of the Canadian government. It may not always be true. Uh, I know somebody who filed his own taxes, maybe he can help me. Okay, great, you know, 
that might work, but most likely everybody's case is different. If your friend is in Manitoba and you're in an Ontario, I wouldn't recommend that. If you're setting up a business, you need proper tax consultation. You need tax planning. So you need immigration planning, you need tax planning, you need proper HR, you need logistics, you need whatever, whether it's marketing, this is all required. So that's another easy mistake. I'll learn English or French when I'm there. Yeah, that's great. If you want to spend Canadian dollars living here, not making money for one or two years, great. You know, feel free to come over. But if you have a base before you come here so you can communicate, you will be light years ahead. Don't, don't put yourself back one or two years and trying to struggle to learn the language, whether it's English or French, um, to catch up. So do your homework, going back to the previous slide. Homework also means being able to communicate in the country you go to. So if you go to Taiwan, if you go to Turkey, if you go to Dubai, if I come to Brazil, I need to know a little bit about the language. I need to do at least some base work, okay? And then number four, interprovincial transactions. So that's a messy affair. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's a nightmare. And you, you think you're in the same country, so it's easy to do it. But in certain products or services, especially products, if you're doing interprovincial transit, there's a lot of regulations in place. So it depends what you're selling. So you make sure you're handling, you're checking this out with your uh, local consultants or the people who you're doing a joint venture with, because interprovincial trans are a nightmare. And me, as an immigrant who's you know grown up in Canada, I'm still learning about this. And no one person can tell you everything about it because it's just so big and vast. And that was basically my four easy mistakes. And of course, that, those are our contact info. And after 32 years, I'm still learning in Canada as a first generation immigrant. So that means I'm still learning about the tax act. I'm still learning about HST claims and credits. I'm still learning about interprovincial transactions and regulation. Every day there's something to learn here. I don't know why, I guess every country should be the same, but it's an ongoing process. So don't expect to know everything the first year you come over uh, and make sure you do your homework and your research and you tie up with the proper professionals. Okay, so that's my two cents about um, succeeding in Canada or probably any other country that you plan to go to. Thank you. Great, so the, great information. Uh, we actually got one question from Bernadette Fernandez in New Brunswick. And Bernadette is actually a wonderful business connector in New Brunswick. She's a bit of a celebrity. And actually, she's a big celebrity. What am I saying? Um, <laughs> but but she had wanted, just wanted to know, are you uh, uh, registered with the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Project? Um, uh, no. As, so with the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Project, you, the employers are registered. So yeah. not the immigration consultants or the lawyers, right? But so, you, and, and so if you have candidates who are interested in the maritime provinces, you could actually- Yeah, exactly. So them. basically what happens is that we, for example, we recently received a permanent residency for one of our clients who immigrated through New Brunswick through the entrepreneur program. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're based in Toronto doesn't mean we just do Ontario. We work across Canada and our clients are spread across from BC to Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Quebec. So we don't need to be registered in each province except Quebec, because you know, Quebec is always the exception. Uh, but yes, we are allowed to deal with New Brunswick, Atlantic Immigration Pilot, and nine out of the 10 other provinces that, um, that are available for immigration and business. And where are your other offices? I I've, uh, Dubai. Where Istanbul, else are you? Istanbul and Dubai. And yes. hopefully one day we'll have hopefully some. Hopefully, Sao Paulo yeah. too. Right? Sao yeah. Paulo yeah. too, yes. Yeah, yeah. but right now yeah, we're in Toronto, uh, Brazil, uh, Dubai, and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Istanbul. His mind and, is already in Brazil. That's yeah, yeah, his mind is. <laughs> it snowed today in Toronto, folks. So we're all ready to go to Brazil now. All our minds um, are in Brazil right now. Exactly. But Reza, one thing that I have noticed too is how much um, interactivity you're doing too with a lot of the foreign students. Have you found foreign students are also interested in immigrating and is there pathways for them? I know that's yeah. not something we talked about, but I'm just. Um, uh, pe pe when I talk to people at the various colleges, they seem to know you. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay, I thought I'd ask. 
<laughs> no, yeah, I mean, basically we have a dedicated education department which handles admissions, consultations, uh, permanent residency pathways for international students. More than 90% of international students intend to apply for permanent residency and stay in Canada. So obviously it's a huge path for immigration to Canada. It's typically, you know, they consider the easy route. It's not as easy as some people think. And it's an $18 billion industry. So yes. you can imagine how significant it is for the Canadian government, the provinces, the institutions, and also COVID recovery. Yeah, yeah super key. What I think it's so interesting, though, is uh, we just had a conversation with um, uh, Julie Dershowitz, who's the MP who sits on the uh, uh, chairs, the Immigration Committee in Parliament, and um, uh, she's really investigating some of the issues that we do have in terms of these students who are being rejected, and they're being rejected um, for reasons that are not thought through entirely, I believe, I believe. and so um, what I think you're going to find is greater action on the government's behalf because everybody has been trained here. They have understood uh, Canadian culture. They have made their families here. They've already done a couple of years of school and now they and one or two years of a work permit. And, uh, you know, they, they really have paid their dues and deserve the opportunity for that pathway to immigration. Exactly. I mean, 50 percent of it, we can say it's it's the government's, let's say, over, you know, uh, oversight on this. Uh, but 50% sometimes the students pick the wrong route too. It's yep. just, they just, you know, it's like when they're weighing all their options, they pick the, the least likely to success, let's say. True, perhaps a, a school that's too cheap and in fact doesn't have what it promises and uh, or one that just doesn't have a good success rate. In fact, they've, your rule number uh, five, I think research, 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 they didn't do their research. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and and exactly. then you put yourself at the mercy of something that you're not, you don't know what you're getting yourself into, right? Sure. If you're buying a car, you're gonna do some research, right? You're not just gonna go in dealership and he or she will just tell you, oh, this is the best car in the world, right? I mean. Yeah, not not the case. I have a, another quick question for you too. Somebody has, uh, this is uh, Jesus Santos has just asked, um, he's interested in, in buying an up and running business or perhaps a franchise. And uh, what kind of investment is, is the, the magic number there? Ah, well, it, it depends on the, which program you apply. So provinces already have minimum set limits. So they tell you minimum 150 or minimum $200,000 or minimum 250. But when you go into the federal programs, the international mobility programs, let's say the entrepreneur and true company transfer, there is no magic number. It's based on significant investment in reference to that industry. So if you're doing an ice cream stand, well, that's different than if you're doing a cement uh, factory, right? But usually if you talk to a lot of people in the industry who've been doing this for years and have worked for government, they like the big number, 250, mm -hmm. right? 250,000. I usually say with 150,000 plus, you could probably get away with it as long as it's not in the big cities. Yes. Right? If you invest 200,000, let's say you invest $150,000 in Toronto, that's not Nothing. a lot. That could be Nothing. a Manchu walk in a mall. Okay, yeah. maybe if you're lucky. And that's in St. Catharines. Maybe. I was just going to say, that's not a Toronto mall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. If you re invest that 150,000 in, I don't know, Thunder Bay or, or somewhere in New Brunswick, a rural, that's a significant exactly. economic benefit. Right. So it's all relative. So I would say don't look at anything 150 in general. If you're looking at provincial program, the guidelines are stated on the website. So they typically start at 150 or 100 regional and then 150. But two to 200,000 to 250 is very common as a minimum yes. investment. But be careful. Be careful. This is like the, the little detail that most people miss. If you buy a business, in a lot of cases, the province will not consider the purchase price as the investment amount. They want the investment amount to grow the business. So if you're buying an ice cream stand for a million dollars, good for you. We're going to only accept $150,000 of that. The rest is good for the guy who sold you a million dollar ice cream stand, right? So isn't that interesting grow the business so this is something a lot of people miss like oh i'll just pay three hundred thousand for this business 
No, that's not going to get you through, especially through the provincial programs. For the federal, no, it's different. But through the provincial programs, they're very, very picky on that. But these are, these are questions, these are answers that, that um, people don't expect. Like, for instance, the number of people I've heard who said, I'm going to spend a quarter million dollars on a franchise. I'm going to walk in and run it, and that's my investment. And in fact, you have just said something very clear. The investment is the money to grow the business. Yes, exactly. We really have to underline that. Yeah, exactly. Plus, each province will have their own shareholder requirements. So some will accept 33%, some will accept only 100%. In Ontario, it's only 100%. Uh, plus, you have to be careful about the hiring, the economic benefit. Hiring of, of Canadians is a critical part. Plus, it should be related to your previous business experience. Right? Exactly. So you've got so three things you, there. Yeah, if you we were working in a petrochemical plant and then now you're selling... Uh, uh, like, I don't know, like hats out of a store, that you're not going to get a lot of points for that in terms of, you know, applying for or getting invited to apply under the provincial programs. So the economic benefit is crucial, the hiring of potential uh, employees and helping the employment situation in Canada, mm -hmm. as well as having a related industry sector and experience yeah it's not Keep. mandatory but it helps plus a, another point was about franchise so not every prom province accepts franchise investment yes yeah so again so research do, research some do some don't and some say if the franchise is not present in this uh, province they'll accept it wow invaluable information i'm going to introduce yeah. me now i was gonna say it's like you know, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no but it's just that raise that raise this stuff is so interesting i yeah, mean it's it's, sure. it's it's invaluable but folks i'm going to give a little uh, a pitch about um my company and and also uh really about my five points but here's the crazy thing so we worked on these separately and raise and i have three of the same five points so <laughs> so they're real <laughs> Exactly. So uh, just give me a second here, and I'm going to just switch to my um, uh, PowerPoint, and here we go. So I am uh, Peter Hawkins, and I am the uh, co-owner of Mellow Hawk Logistics. I'm the hawk in Mellow Hawk, and I am the co-chair of the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce, and I am delighted. So I want you all to know that uh, uh, membership has its privileges, and of course, we have all kinds of things that we share uh, with our members and uh, promotions such as these, promoting companies is something that we do and we really like doing that. Um, but in my experience at Mellowhawk, one of the things is that I want to share is I'm the only Canadian born person in my company. Mm -hmm. Everybody is from somewhere else. Why? Because the best experience for my company is no Canadian experience. What I want are people who experience the world, have no fear of the world and are able to uh, understand what goes on um, when it comes to international shipping in other markets. I can do the Canadian stuff. I need somebody to do all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to talk about the five key challenges to newcomers. Uh, but first, I will give you just a quick little, um, uh, how do I advance this, Peter? There we go. Uh, think about us. Uh, we are a freight forwarding company, and so we do shipping around the world. Uh, Brazil is a big market for us, about 16% of our business, but the United States and China are huge markets for us. Um, Europe is very big for us as well. So we'll do everything from warehousing and storage across Canada, uh, personal effects, although we, um, it's painful to do it. We don't want to see you go. We like to see you come. Um, intermodal shipments, which are the air uh, shipments and ocean shipments that are containers that uh, then can go on rail. Uh, we do distribution across Canada. We do um, uh, trade shows. We have uh, uh, all the right insurances and permits for dangerous cargo. We do everything from... Uh, um, vaccines, we do viruses, we do a lot of medical things, we do heavy equipment, we also do some cool things like museum collections, art collections, and we also uh, ship Elton John's costumes around the world for his mm -hmm. costume exhibit, um, wow. and lots of planning and consulting. So it's just cool stuff. I can tell you all about Mariah Carey's dresses, because we do her stuff too. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, see, we don't make any money on that, but they're fun to talk about. <laughs> So here is what I want to say right off the bat is take your research seriously. Reza finished with that. I'm starting with that. That research is so key, but it's both professional and personal. You have to understand what the rules are, what the situation is. You need to use 
everybody you can to get the right advice. But that also means personally. Do you have a network here? Do you have a support here? Because when you leave your home country, you are going to lose that support you had at home. So if your spouse has got a course they're doing online and you have to be at an event at home, you had childcare because you had your, your in-laws there. But here, you're not gonna have childcare. You're gonna to have to make a decision about where you're going to go. So I really, really, really want you to understand that there's both professional research to do and personal research. In your professional research, use professional uh, services. Business association, boards of trade, agencies like Ingui. And I, I wanna stress, people say, oh, but I could do it myself. Canada is a country of do-it-yourself. No. It's not, it looks like you can do it yourself, but if you don't have professionals who have seen it all, I have a shipping company, you can ship a box by yourself and I wish you all the very best. I hope it succeeds, I hope it gets there, but I can guarantee that it'll get there properly, appropriately with no risk. And so that's what the, the difference. So if you, if you want to uh, really improve your chances, and as you know, when you arrive, the border services uh, individual can reject you, your best possible chance is the person who has the experience. Financing, do your budget, then double it. I can't tell you how many times financing has become a problem. Financing is very, very complicated in that people have saved all the money they ever had ever, and it still wasn't enough because the time you're going to spend paying off your housing and bills and things like that before you get fully established will be double what you think it is. It'll be double what your plan is. And I want you to be very careful of that. Keeping in mind, those markets of Vancouver and Toronto are very expensive, crazy expensive. So really interesting markets like the Maritimes, like Fredericton, St. John, Moncton, Halifax, those are very cool places. Winnipeg, super cool places. Why? Because the costs are much less and they, your money goes much further. Understand Canadian networking and cultural differences. I deal a lot with Brazilians, and when I talk to Brazilians, Brazilians are nosy. And I wanna tell you, Canadians are not nosy. Brazilians are huggers, although not in COVID, but Canadians are not huggers. And so you, and those two little things are actually big things. And what I really want you to understand is how Canadians do things, especially in the cyber world. In the cyber world, you can connect because you can control everything in this little picture here and everything on your LinkedIn and all your web pages. So you can actually control exactly what your potential client, your potential contact is going to see, but you need to do it by understanding how we do things in the Canadian way. And finally, make sure your family is on side. Your teenager who has a new boyfriend in, in their home country is now gonna leave them and come to Canada and is going to be the worst nightmare in your family. Your spouse who is going to be home alone, perhaps not speaking the language with no support while you're working 14 hours a day on your business and then you come home and find out that he is, you know, killed himself is, is, is bad. You really have to understand how many times that the spouse depressed has been the reason for failure. Um, I have a situation right now in my own office where I have somebody very close to their PR and in fact they are leaving. They're going to leave because the spouse has said, I've had enough, I'm lonely, I'm cold, I have to go. Now Canada is a beautiful country and we have many, many resources for people to grow and get support and have a wonderful life and a wonderful life for your family and children but you've got to do the homework. You've got to manage your expectations. And I wanna address one more thing, the weather. Canada is cold, no doubts about it, it's cold. So the key to living in a country with cold weather is don't be cold, dress warm. I am inside my office and I'm wearing a t-shirt and a shirt and a vest and a jacket, okay? I am warm, I have socks on, I wear boots in the snow, I wear shoes inside, I am warm. South Americans come here and the first thing they do is wear shorts and tank top and Havianas in their house and they complain about the cold. And I say, put some damn clothes on. It is a case of we live in a cold country. But this cold weather has two other things that you have to remember. One is you're gonna spend a lot of time inside and that's a lot of family time inside that could be stressful when you have, we're not used to that in your home country. But the second thing is it's dark. Dark skies are almost as challenging as cold weather. You need to really plan for the fact that you don't get the sun you get in so many other countries. Now, Canada, again, wonderful place, but you have a real obstacle here in isolation, 
weather, language, finances, all of those things can be surpassed and you can succeed, but you must prepare for them. And that was my shtick. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to stress, Reza, just one last thing. So you saw Reza talked about research. I talked about research. Reza talked about financing. I talked about fans, financing. Reza talked about family. I talked about family. We both have very different experiences, but we see the same things over and over. And I can't impress upon you how important it is to address those things right off the bat. It really is important. 100%, uh, Peter. Also, the fact about the finance, the financial planning that you mentioned is critical. During COVID, I received two calls, two cases where they sold everything. They came here to work. Uh, they, they were working here and their permanent residency at some point was refused or the employer laid them off. Uh, so they had spent everything by then and, and they didn't have a plan B in place. And, and then there was mistakes that were done. So there are some horror stories, nightmare stories that you want to avoid by planning. Uh, so exactly what you mentioned, when you're doing your financial planning, don't, don't think that it's going to be exactly according to your financial plan. You double it, as you mentioned. But you have to have a contingency plan. You have to consider all the scenarios and all the bad scenarios as well, right? Because it's going to be the last thing you want is to run out of money because your company, because you thought that it's going to take two years for your sales cycle and then it took three. And then for the last year, what happened? Or there was a delay on the permanent, permanent program because we know that we're all immigrants. You know that that happens, right? Like sometimes it's supposed to happen in two months and then it's a year and you're still, the process is still ongoing. So uh, the planning is definitely um, very, very important. Um, I have a question. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I have a question for Reza. So, I mean, we mentioned about, and again, this has been uh, talked over and over again, planning your finance, your family, make sure everybody is on board. How can Ingui, uh, I mean, you guys offer a lot of consulting services as well, right? So how can Ingui support those ones who are still kind of figuring it out if the startup visa or they like which program to go or how to approach immigration in Canada? Well, basically, one thing that we do with any client is look at their eligibility criteria, and that's paramount in, in terms of immigration. So there may be 75 plus programs of immigration in Canada, but how many are you eligible for? You could be eligible for 20 of them, but which ones are more, most likely to succeed for your path for immigration? And then we, we sort of filter it down and we bring it down to two or three, and then we pinpoint this one or two, and then we give that option to you. We tell you the costs involved, the risks involved, and the timelines. And then you make a decision that, okay, I prefer this route because of the risk or because of the investment amount, right? So, we, we break it all down for you. So basically, you know, it's like a detailed plan and, you know, comparison on what programs are available. You tell us your budget you, and you give us your profile and then we'll crunch the numbers for you. That's basically how it goes. And that's why yeah, it's invaluable. So yeah, is, that's why it's so important to have like that kind of help because you go yeah. to those 75 programs like, oh my God, there's so many. I'm sure I'm going to get in one of them, but then how yeah, do yeah. we analyze and- 100%. And, and the point is, that we don't push one down everybody's throat, okay? There are like, you know, there's, there's a typical technique, you know, one program is maybe available to us or it has the biggest profit for us. So that's the one we're pushing down. So when you, when you talk or see an immigration company and they're just promoting one program all the time, then that's a red flag, okay? So they see everything cookie cutter, it fits in here. It doesn't fit, they're still gonna try to fit it through. Yeah. And, that's, and that's where things can go wrong. And then we do tell you no sometimes. So that's another part of our company that, that may, may be different than others is that if we see that you don't have the eligibility criteria or that there's a high chance of refusal, we'll tell you upfront. And we may not accept your application because to be honest with you, why would you waste money and why would you, we try to do something that's going to hit a dead end, yeah. right? So either you don't have the right profile or either you're applying under the wrong program. Um, one of the questions that just came up was, uh, 
about industry sectors that um, look like the ones that will prosper in the future. Um, okay, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you what I have seen that has changed this year from past years. And I'm kind of surprised. Obviously, PPE has been a huge hot topic, but very risky. 50% of the people come, uh, who came in with PPE businesses doing uh, the uh, personal protective equipment like masks and things like that succeeded, but 50% of them also failed. And they failed because they ended up having masks that had mold that weren't what they thought, thought they were, or they didn't have them pre-sold and then found that they couldn't sell them because they, again, they weren't what they thought they were. And uh, we've had some insurance um, issues where uh, insurance companies have come to us and asked us to store seized um, products. And so that's been a very interesting cash cow for me, but terrible for uh, whoever the person was who took a chance on this product and also paid exorbitant routes to bring it here. Um, but two things that I've seen that have been very interesting. Um, one is uh, seniors products are still growing, but they have to be cost effective because seniors don't necessarily have the disposable income. So you have to find seniors products that really do work and are needed. And every product, by the way, should be a solution to a problem, not something you're in love with. I find a lot of South Americans say, oh, I love Brazilian lingerie. And then they can't sell it here because Canadian women are not skinny Brazilian women. And um, so it becomes a, just a catastrophe. And I've watched people lose their shirt on, <laughs> literally, on this kind of stuff. <laughs> However, um, one thing that is hot is the beauty business. So I have four new entrepreneurs this year in 2020 who are all doing more than half a million dollars each with their own beauty lines. And they are totally unexpected. One is doing uh, African-Canadian beauty care. That is very interesting. One is doing uh, evangelical beauty care. And how's that for a, a shock? Because the message she has given is that uh, is, is her own philosophy, but she has a huge audience for it. And her business is booming. It's been very good for me. So you, you, you just don't know what's gonna take off but what you can do is understand what the market is. People are at home, they're on video, so there are people who are interested in looking better. People are, um, uh, any kind of tech, tech seems to be really growing. Consultancy services are growing. Home fitness is growing. Those are all real industries. Um, uh, what, uh, uh, and also services that everything from coaching to, um, I have one person who I, is a friend of mine who has started a journal writing service for people who can't be bothered to write in their own journals. Okay, you're gonna laugh, what? but she made $10,000 last month. And mm -hmm. I thought, holy cow, <laughs> so, you know. Writing and, uh, journals for someone else? writing journals for many other people wow. and there are people because she's a writer and she said she wasn't getting the, the writing business okay i know that's not really an immigration thing but i just thought business is crazy right. you'd be surprised what becomes a business right no, and business, uh, business peter is a business that could be potentially whether it's immigration or not right so everybody's exactly. looking to succeed whether it's linked to immigration or not and that's the thing with us as well we don't it doesn't necessarily have to be immigration Right. Exactly. It's just, it's crazy. Um, one thing I do want to underline too, and, and I know you're getting it in the notes too, directly from Ingwe too, but just remember, they are going to give a real um, personal uh, 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 insight into your own journey. So please don't forget to reach out to them. Okay. And I know that's a plea for business, but in fact, pays the bills. So I just want everybody to remember that this is a resource that we're making available to you. And by all means, you should you should reach out to uh, Ingwi directly. Um, now, somebody asked about the cultural differences, and I'm going to talk about an interesting cultural difference for those people who are still in their home country. If you're still in the home country, you need to start your cyber networking. And your cyber networking means you have to have something to show. So that means making sure that your LinkedIn profile, whether it's for your company or for you, is completely filled out with a background image and a portrait image that's welcoming and friendly, a tagline, a clear contact information, links that work, that don't take me into something bizarre. Make sure it's all complete. Completed, okay, and when you can do that, then when you're reaching out to people, there's actually a formula to reach out to Canadians, and that formula is you greet, 
you compliment, you ask for advice. You're not firing off resumes and you're not firing off please to buy something. What you're doing is you are networking. You're making a genuine connection. You are not collecting names. It's not about the most names you get. It is about the connections you make, the real connections. And you can all do that at home. Canadians fully like to be asked for advice. They like to be complimented. They don't like to be nagged. And so you avoid nagging by do not send your resume, do not immediately introduce your problem. What you do is you introduce a conversation. And when you ask for advice and they give advice, be sure and ask about them. Get a conversation going. That's key. So Peter, can we go a little bit of, uh, and then I'll go back to Reza, but there's a couple of questions here just in, the, uh, uh, in time. So someone asked like, and I know you're the expert of this, can you give us some uh, useful tips on the cultural aspects for Canadians? So how to, uh, for, like, how to do business in Canada if you're from Brazil, what are the differences? Uh, well, it's the, the biggest thing is, is in both cases, Canadians have preconceptions about Brazilians and Brazilians have preconceptions about Canadians. Canadians believe that Brazilians, the women go to work wearing feathers and the guys play soccer all day. And uh, the fact is there is an enormous professional middle class in Brazil who has high expectations and they have, they're used to buying brand names and they, they want good service. And so there is, there is a, 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 an effort to introduce those uh, exchange that information so we really understand each other. Brazilians have this idea that we're just northern United States and we may or may not live in snow all the time. But the fact is we have 30 degrees in the summer and it's just as hot and we complain about the heat the same way they do. But what I think is most important is understanding that Canadians want to be uh, connected with genuinely and Canadians don't say no. Uh, if you're having talking to somebody and they say, you're terrific. I really liked you. That's great. That's also no. Okay? I want you to understand that the only yes is an actual yes. Everything else is no. And I think a lot of newcomers are struggle because Canadians, in their effort to be nice, actually screw them up a little bit because we're not clear with our language. And that and then and newcomers become frustrated because they really liked it. I'm waiting for the call. And I already know, I always say, what exactly did they say? And I know as soon as they tell me, they're never going to call. The call is not going to happen. And so I want everybody to manage their expectations. It is a case of if you can understand what the between the line comment is, that can really help you. And it's all about communication then, right? That's why it's so important for you to prepare yourself and have a good English or French, depending on where you're coming, to be able that you can communicate in a Canadian way. I mean, we know that as Brazilians, we speak over on top of people and we're all over the place. We talk probably way too much and uh, it's, a, it's an adjustment and sometimes it takes time. Well, it's, it's funny because I have dealt with uh, Central Europeans and, and there's no small talk. It's immediately getting into barking the phrases and I tease them about it. But in fact, that is just their cultural difference. I've talked to Brazilians who've asked me deeply personal questions right off the bat. And I'm thinking, I do not know you. I don't want to share. I have talked to... Um, uh, people all over the world who have just different ways of communicating. And so my philosophy is I try to be as clear as I can and and try and I try to be kind about it though. I shouldn't be annoyed because someone doesn't understand what my culture does. What I'm trying to do is be welcoming. But in every case, likability is a huge factor. And I come back to the fact that you can control this image here. You can control everything on this screen. And so since likability is such an important factor, make it likable, be warm and welcoming, make sure your business is something we really want, not something you have to do a hard sell. Reza, what's your experience on that? Have you had the same kind of, of issues where people just didn't understand what was being said to them by Canadians? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, cross-cultural boundaries or limitations, but over time, it, it's a struggle for many newcomers, right? And as well, if you're de dealing in international trade, so it could be people who are not even planning to. So you have somebody sitting in, in Africa, somebody sitting somewhere else in the world, and they're trying to transact. And that those cultural differences sometimes um, may lead to, you know, not the deal not going through or misunderstanding. So it's, you know, when you start with emails here, it's hi, hello. When you go overseas, it's all dear, dear this, dear that, right? 
Um, so there's all these little things and, and a lot of misunderstanding can be, can, can be the root cause of this cultural difference, which shouldn't be. But, and then when people come over to Canada, it's even more difficult because they've immigrated, they've come here physically, as you said, and then they're, they're getting mixed signals. People don't understand them. They don't understand. They have these expectations and they don't come, you know, they don't uh, materialize. So 100%. So whether it's immigration or not, that cultural difference is always there for everybody around the globe. Regardless, doing business or immigrating, it's always an issue. I have a question here. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Reza, for this because you also have a lot of experience with uh, businesses in Canada as well. So uh, one of the problems of newcomers is to find new customers, right? Especially if you sell to wholesalers. So do you have any advice for who is uh, trying to find customers in Canada? I'm no expert. Everybody has their own experience. Okay. So who, who asked that question? Let me it was see. Jerry. Jerry. Okay, Jerry. So everybody you ask will give you a different answer, I think, on that, because it depends on what, how they experience it. Peter will you know, give his answer right after mine as well. And my personal experience is that the trust level, okay? Uh, so when somebody's calling or you're doing a cold call or you're trying to get in, the first thing is, okay, who are you? Do you have a local base or are you, you know, working out of your basement? You know, do you have something to present yourself? I, what I did with some of my, one of my companies, which is in Quebec, is I actually hired local people who are already in the industry. It cost me a lot more, but I brought in people who are already in the industry, who are already selling, who already have a familiar face. So when they knock on the door, it's, hey, it's you, John, you know? It's not gonna be Reza, right? Reza will go in with them at some point, but the key is that familiar face. But again, that could be a budget issue for a lot of people. So everybody's experience is different. This is what I saw is that if you got localized, if you have experts in the industry, if they can work for you, if you can kind of grab a few there, it's great. Other than that, try to localize yourself. Make sure you have a base there. You make sure you can, like if you're communicating, your communicating, communication skills are key, right? If English is not your first language, on the phone, you're automatically at a handicap, mm -hmm. right? So there's these little things that over time, you know, you kind of realize that I went through them and, and I know Peter has some great advice. So Peter, what do you think about that? Question? Well, what I have found is really useful here is to piggyback. So a lot of people who are startups, particularly or new entrepreneurs only have one or two product lines. So what they can do is find someone who has comparable product lines and piggyback on them when you sell to the wholesaler. And that has been a key way. Now you're going to lose some margin. Of course, you're going to lose some margin, but what you are is you're going to get in. And so that's the difference right there. I have found that a very useful tool and I find um, um, you can create a good relationship. And now people say, I don't wanna lose control. I wanna have control and all that stuff. Well, you can have all the control you like and still not have a sale. What you need to do is find ways to sell the product in. And if your product is really everything you want it to be, then they're gonna come back to you. And, and as you add SKUs, you're going to be uh, pull through, but I just, uh, I, I can't impress upon you that you have to actually share. You have to actually understand that, that uh, a startup is not actually a lonely thing. It is something that involves partnerships and some trust and some level of trust and a good lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, I think that as an additional too, is like, uh, uh, like look for, for, for associations that can help you, look for support system that can help you connect. Because again, as Peter said, after your, pr your product's at the door, then it's probably gonna be sell it yourself. The problem is how to get it there, right? And sometimes the help of like a consultant or someone that knows the market that can work with you to open those doors can cut corners and can speed up the process by a lot and make the difference between a make or break um, as well. One last question for Reza. Um, so what's the most common problems applicants to the startup visa go through when trying to set up their business in Canada? And uh, can someone work? This is all part of the same question. So there's three parts to this. Main problem startup visa goes through. Can the, the owner or the entrepreneur work while 
uh, developing the business or is the visa exclusive for the development of the, the, the business? And last one is an advice that you give for a non-business person interested in the startup visa. Okay, so this is a, this is a five minute question. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole webinar. This has, loaded, this, uh, yeah. loaded question. Uh, okay, so the startup visa, obviously it's not a visa, it's actually a permanent residency. And yes, you can apply for a work permit when you're applying for your permanent residency. So when you receive the letter of support and you're applying for your permanent residency, concurrently you'll be applying for a work permit, okay? It's not mandatory though. So the permanent residency is the main route. The work permit is optional. So you could decide two paths. One is I'm gonna stay back home and just you know chill out until my PR comes and then I'll come in and then start the business. Or two is, no, I wanna start my business while my PR is being processed. But then be careful because while your PR is being processed and you're here and you don't do anything, that can undermine your PR process. Okay, and that's why a lot of people are sometimes contemplating, should I, if they don't already have traction with their project here, they think, okay, maybe I should just wait for my PR. Um, so there, there's no obligation to start the business before you, your PR is received and, after, and that's your main intention. After your permanent residence is received, then you know, for whatever reason, let's say you were planning for some great idea and COVID messed it up. Well, you decide to do another kind of startup. It's, they're not gonna hang you. This is, nobody can withdraw that permanent residency from you. Uh, so that's just food for thought there. I hope I answered a few of those questions that was loaded into that paragraph. And then the last point, any non-immigration. Well, non-immigration is skilled immigration, basically, uh, unless you're married or have a Canadian spouse or partner. Um, the skilled immigration stream is whether you get enough points to be invited directly from your home country based on age, education, work experience, and language ability, uh, or you... You know, a lot of people just come here and study for their master's or post-secondary, and then there's some direct path to permanent residency if you have, and you, and your English is already pretty good from what I saw, so maybe you should consider that. A direct path to permanent residency based on a master's, and you can always do two masters. People think, I got my master's, I have to do my PhD. No, you can get three masters. I was talking to somebody from Mexico about two weeks ago. They had three masters. So yeah, so I was like, I didn't even have one. Okay, but <laughs> the point is, you know, so don't never assume and always research. And, and th that was a very good question, so. And uh, I have one last question that is not from, uh, from the group, but it's, uh, so I, I understand that, I mean, we've been talking about immigrating to Canada and how to come to Canada, but I understand that Ingui also helps people to go to different countries. So what is the global mobility programs at Ingui and how do you support different uh, immigration to different countries? Yeah, so not everybody's eligible to come to Canada or sometimes it's just too far away. So we have other countries that we help with certain types of residency investment programs or citizenship investment programs. So for example, Spain, we have a low investment residency option. So if you have income from your home country and you just want your family to have a good, comfortable place where they can reside in. Um, so we have, we, we deal with Spain, we deal with Portugal, we deal with Cyprus. Uh, we also have a few Caribbean countries, but they're more like mail order passports. You just pay and the passport comes to your door like Amazon. <laughs> uh, so, um, but yeah, we do have some countries in Europe and uh, as well in the Caribbean. So we do assist with them. We also work with some private schools in Europe as well. Uh, and I, you know, so basically there's uh, different countries that we assist with, not just Canada. And we also do the EB-5 program in the US, which is the, uh, basically the investment, the passive investment program for green and, cards. Uh, and then that was my, gonna be my last question, but then Jerry just typed it here as well. Uh, I mean, I know, again, based on the consultancy program that you offer as well, some immigrants that are working for the startup visas offer the service to introduce projects to angel investors and partners. Does INGUI help with the business project as well? 
Uh, yes, we do. It depends on what is required. Uh, but yeah, we, for certain clients, we handle A to Z. And that's all I can say at this point, because each case is different, each case is unique, but we have a, two, we call it turnkey solution. So sometimes when they want to start a business, sometimes they want, they want to do startup visa, you know, same like students, they, they need a school to come in, they need a study plan, they need a study permit, then they need other things later on. So we have turnkey solution where, where we can consider us as a one-stop shop. Almost. This is amazing. So mm -hmm. in, uh, in a matter of time, because we're already running out of time and we could be talking here for hours uh, to go, but is there one last advice uh, that you would give Reza for someone that's looking to immigrate to a country? Something that we haven't mentioned yet uh, here. Uh, well, the fact that everybody is in this webinar, and I think that's the first step if they're actually looking at coming to Canada. So I think you're a step ahead of the competition because you're already researching. You're already trying to network or you're trying to identify or recognize people you should be networking with. So I think you're already on the right path. So I don't think you need any more advice from me. <laughs> uh, Peter, any last uh, advice? Uh I'm, I'm, I'm going to underline that, but I, I uh, raise is right. You're already researching and you're already networking, but it th that's just the start. Start doing serious research, serious networking. You really have to have so many things in place before you start, and you can do it at home after the kids are put to bed, sitting at the computer in your underwear. You can do it, okay? So I, I really want to stress it's actually easy to do, but you must do it. Thank you so much. So I would like to thank uh, Peter and Reza for your insights here today. This was an amazing discussion. If anyone has any further questions to Reza or to Peter, please uh, send it directly to Ingui. I see that they've been posting, but I just uh, sent all the, the contact information there. You can connect with Peter either directly through LinkedIn or through us as well. We'll be happy to pass the message along. If there's anything that BCC can help you as well in terms of networking, connecting you locally, help you open the doors, please come talk to me. I'll be happy to, to discuss um, how we can support uh, uh, startups and small business members looking to come into Canada. So I would like to uh, as well thank our the BCC annual sponsors, Vale, EGC, Export Development Canada, Brookfield Lending Mining, Votoran Ching, Samara Cement, and Cisco Bahio for the support. Without their support, none of these events would be possible. And I really hope that the information that we shared here today was fruitful and relevant for your business. I hope you keep engaging with the BCCC. Please sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. Uh, I hope that you all stay healthy and stay safe and stay home. And I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you again. Nice to see you. Thank, Thank you. you.